Good morning and welcome again. We thank you so much for coming and thank you, David, that was beautiful. Also make sure to have your own Bible and your own hymnal throughout this particular service. Hear now the word of the Lord as found in the meditation scripture. This is a promise God made to Jeremiah chapter 31. Hear the word of the Lord in Jesus' name. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. I will put my law within them and I will write it on their hearts and I will be their God. They shall be my people and no longer shall each one teach his neighbor and each his brother saying, know the Lord for they shall all know me from the least of them to the greatest declares the Lord for I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more. And now comes our call to worship from Isaiah chapter 40. I'll read the light parts. You please, together, we'll read the, the bold parts. Isaiah 40. To whom then will you liken God? Or what likeness compare with him? To whom then will you compare me, that I should be like him, says the Holy One? Lift up your eyes on high and see who created thee. He who brings out their host by number, calling them all by name, by the greatness of his might, and because he is strong in power, not one is missing. Please rise as we sing three select verses from Hymn number 210, Praise to the Lord the Almighty. We do indeed adore you. You alone are God. You alone are the Holy One, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. We praise you. We thank you. We invoke your presence during this service. Thank you we can meet even after months where we weren't able to meet together. And please keep us all safe and well. Thank you now. And Lord Jesus, we pray in the words that you taught us, saying together, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, 
Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Please be seated. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, David. The Lord does.
and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. As the people of God gathered as the local body of Christ, it is important that as we assemble ourselves together, that we never forget that God is holy. His righteousness is beyond compare, and we are just sinful creatures made of dust. But praise be to the Lord Jesus Christ that in his precious blood, we can have our sins forgiven, constantly forgiven at the work, his work of the cross. So please confess with me, New Presbyterian Church, that you and I are indeed sinners and that this morning we receive fresh grace from the Lord Jesus Christ. Please pray the corporate confession of sin along with me. It is found printed in your order of service. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name, amen. Please take a silent moment Confess your own sins to the Lord Jesus Christ this morning. Father, we confess as your people that we are indeed sinful. We mean the prayer that we just said to you. Thought, word, and deed by the things we've done and said and thought and the things that we've left undone, unsaid, and unthought, we have violated your holy law. But Lord, we praise you that there is grace that abounds at the foot of the cross. We praise you for the gift of your son, the atonement sacrifice whose blood cleanses us of all of our sins this morning so that we can be free and cleansed from the condemnation of sin. We praise you. And now receive the assurance of pardon this morning that indeed your sins by the blood of Christ are forgiven. 1 John 1 reminds us, If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Amen. Please pray with me. Our Father and our God, we come with joyful hearts this morning. We have confessed our sins to you. We have sung praises to you. We have received the assurance that Jesus' blood is sufficient from your word. And so, Lord, we come to you with bold boldness, with bold, through bold access in your son as your sons and daughters. And we come to you in prayer. Lord, we come only through the merits of Christ. We come only in the power of the Spirit. But, Lord, we do come to you as our Father. Lord, thank you for all that you've done for us. You've given us eternal life. You've washed our sins away. You've gathered us together in the body of Christ. And you've blessed and protected and kept us our whole lives. We thank you, Lord, for your great hand of provision towards our church and towards each one of us. And we praise and exalt you. But, Lord, we are a needy people. And, Lord, we do pray for the things that weigh heavy on our hearts this morning. Oh, Father, we ask that you would be merciful that you would heal and protect and keep people in this country and around the world from COVID-19. We pray, Lord, that you would shield us, that you would protect us. We ask, Lord, for those who are sick with this virus and other things, we ask, Lord, that you would heal and turn in mercy and be gracious for the sake of Jesus, your son. Father, we pray for all those in our body who are sick, 
those who are suffering, those who are, have fallen upon financial difficulties, those who have broken marriages and broken families, those who are depressed and sorrowful. Lord, many of us put on a good face when we come to the house of God, but Lord, we know that you see our hearts. Lord, comfort, heal, provide, and keep your people, your children, we pray. Lord, we pray for Laura, and we ask, Lord, please give the doctors wisdom, this constant bleeding issue that she has. We ask that you would heal her, give the doctors wisdom, and bless her and the entire family. Lord, we lift Carolyn, our sister in Christ, to you. Carolyn Cupper Wepley, grieving the loss of her husband in late May. We ask that your comfort would reach to her by the, your powerful Holy Spirit and her entire family. And Father, we do thank you for our fathers. Lord, we praise you that you are our heavenly Father, but Lord, we thank you for our earthly fathers. And we pray your blessings on all the dads, all the fathers here this morning, those watching online, and Lord, all throughout our nation and our world. We ask, Lord, that you would help those who are Christian godly fathers to continue on. We pray, Lord, that those that don't know you, the fathers that don't know you this morning, that you would draw them to Christ. And Lord, we just pray a special blessing on fathers today. Lord, thank you that you are with your people. And Lord, we would be remiss if we did not mention the persecuted church. We ask, Lord, that you would comfort your bride, the church, this morning. Those, Lord, who not only live under the threat of things like COVID-19, but on top of all of that, Lord, those who are living under tremendous persecution. We ask, Lord, for the lessening of that persecution. We ask for regime changes, if it be your will. We ask that you would lessen their sufferings, but Lord, keep them faithful and fill them with your spirit. And Father, we also lift to you our broken nation. We ask that you would send revival and reformation, that you would send another great awakening by your powerful Holy Spirit. Lord, we ask that you would be gracious to our nation, filled with division, still filled with racism, filled with rioting and looting and law-breaking. Lord, we ask, have mercy on us. We ask and pray all these things in the precious name of Jesus Christ, the one who is King of Kings and is able not only to hear our requests, but to answer according to his power. In his name we pray, amen. We're so glad that you're all here with us this morning. It is good to see every single one of you. And welcome also to all of those who are joining us by live stream this morning. We're glad that you can join us. We're glad to be in the house of God. By way of announcements this morning, please know that as we continue to try to get back to normal, we do want to remain careful and cautious during this COVID-19. We are keeping the church closed throughout the week, all the normal weekly ministries. We're gonna keep those canceled for the time being, and we will continue. Our plan as of now is to continue to meet here for worship at 11 a.m. We ask that you would remain careful and prayerful. And again, our prayer is that each one of you, those of you who are here this morning, we're thankful for you. And those of you who have not joined us, who are watching online, we want you to make a good decision for you that you would feel safe and comfortable in God's timing as you rejoin us for worship. Please stand at this time and let's read the scripture reading this morning. It is found printed in your order of worship. So please rise as we read God's word together this morning. This morning I'll be reading from Exodus chapter 8, selected verses from chapter 8. Verse 1. Then the Lord said to Moses, Go into Pharaoh and say to him, Thus says the Lord, Let my people go that they may serve me. 
But if you refuse to let them go, behold, I will plague all your country with frogs. Then Pharaoh called Moses and Aaron and said, Plead with the Lord to take away the frogs from me and from my people, and I will let the people go to sacrifice to the Lord. Moses said, Be it as you say, so that you may know that there is no one like the Lord our God. But when Pharaoh saw that there was a respite, he hardened his heart and would not listen to them as the Lord had said. Then the Lord said to Moses, Say to Aaron, and stretch out your staff, and strike the dust of the earth, so that it may become gnats in all the land of Egypt. The magicians tried by their secret arts to produce gnats, but they could not. So there were gnats on man and beast. Then the magicians said to Pharaoh, This is the finger of God. But Pharaoh's heart was hardened. And he would not listen to them as the Lord had said. Thus says the Lord, let my people go that they may serve me. Or else, if you will not let my people go, behold, I will send swarms of flies on you and your servants and your people and into your houses. And the houses of the Egyptians shall be filled with swarms of flies and also the ground on which they stand. But on that day, I will set apart the land of Goshen where my people dwell so that no swarms of flies shall be there, that you may know that I am the Lord in the midst of the earth. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. You may be seated. And now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Many years ago, in a place in England called Appledore, they had a very serious mosquito problem. And somebody on the town council came up with the idea, well, why don't we do this? We've heard about a certain type of frogs a certain species of frogs uh, from Hungary, and these frogs take care of mosquitoes. So they agreed, and they got 12 of these special frogs from Hungary, and indeed, the frogs did take care of the mosquito problem. However, these frogs consumed the frogs that were indigenous to that area, the native ones, and worse, these new frogs made some sort of weird sound in the night, sounding almost like laughter or like they were crazy. And it was driving people nuts and they were losing sleep, but there was nothing they could do about it because they were just too numerous. So here to solve one problem, they ended up creating another problem. And we're gonna to look today at frogs, gnats, and flies, and tie that into Father's Day. You may wonder, how does that work? Well, we'll see. Let's look at different portions of our text this morning. Thank you, Pastor Beam, for reading that. And uh, let me go ahead and I'm going to read some of this, starting at verse 1. Then the Lord said to Moses, Go into Pharaoh and say to him, Thus says the Lord, Let my people go, that they may serve me. And he then initiates, as we just heard, he initiates the second plague, which is bringing frogs into all the earth. And... By the time it was finished, Pharaoh said, get, get these frogs out of here. He couldn't stand it anymore. He said, you can go ahead and let your people go to worship in the wilderness or whatever to sacrifice to the Lord. He was, he was fed up with this. Pharaoh was beginning to experience the wrath of God, and he doesn't like it at all. Now, you may wonder, as, as Pastor Bean was talking last week, remember he mentioned the Nile that was turning the Nile River into the blood. That was the first of the plagues. And later we'll see that there was a plague involving the sun darkened. Well, the people worshiped the Nile River and God took that idol and crumbled it before their very eyes. The people worshiped the sun god. They called it Ra, 
in ancient Egypt. And God took that idol and he crumbled it before their very eyes. There was also other gods that the people in Egypt worshipped, including a frog god. You may have noticed on the second page of our little bulletin insert or whatever, the, the uh, summary of today's service, this strange picture uh, near the uh, bottom of the second page. It's a little frog-like creature. That was an ancient Egyptian god. If you want to write it down, you could write it in the little note there. H-E-K-E-T. H-E-K-E-T is one way to spell it. Hecate. And Hecate was a goddess of mirth and of joy. And this was somebody that they worshiped. Now here's what Dr. D. James Kennedy said in the, the D. James Kennedy study Bible. The second plague was an attack by frogs. The frogs were one of the many gods of Egypt. It was the goddess Hecate, which is a form of the Egyptian word Hathor, who was the goddess of love and mirth and joy. I saw, by the way, in the NIV study Bible, it said that Hecate was the goddess of childbirth. And so anyway, they worshiped this goddess and continuing with D. James Kennedy, he said, it's this goddess, Hathor, that the Greeks got the name of their goddess, Aphrodite, the goddess of love and mirth and joy. Well, by the time that those frogs were hopping over everything into their houses, into their ovens, and into their food, into their beds, it wasn't quite as mirthful and joyous as they would have liked it to be. And then when they all died and the nation stank, they were not too thrilled, I believe, with the goddess Hecate or Hathor. So, this is one of these plagues where the gods of Egypt, these idols, are being destroyed before their very eyes. And I think one take-home lesson that we all should learn from these ten plagues is that God is the Lord and there is no other. And all idols will one day be destroyed, including idols that we create in our own minds. John, F., uh, John Calvin once said, the human mind is a, uh, an idle factory. Not idle as in I-D-L-E, because all the jobs went overseas. No, idle, I-D-O-L, as in we worship other things. Now, I've thought about this before. What if you had a God-given dream or a goal, and you really wanted to achieve something, but it became for you such an obsession that it was essentially an idol and God will destroy it in your life. Sometimes dreams in our lives die, but the key is if God is to be glorified in that goal, then he will bring it about in a positive way. But those things that we worship in our lives, idols, he will take and he will destroy them. I heard about a young man that all he wanted, all he worshiped was fancy schmancy cars and what he really really wanted was a Jaguar and guess what one day he was actually able to get a Jaguar and then soon after he was in a car accident and his Jaguar was totaled and the man committed suicide <gasps> he so worshipped that piece of metal and steel and rubber and all those things that go into a jaguar. He so worshipped it that when it was done, he was killing himself. I mean, it's unbelievable. When, you know, we look back and you look at that picture. You can see, by the way, this pic picture of Hecate. You, if you look uh, in Google, you do a Google search under uh, Egyptian hieroglyphics. Hieroglyphics, by the way, you, you study in Greek, it means sacred writings. So you look at these, and you can see this, this frog goddess in different, different parts of this. And we look at that and we think, how in the world can any intelligent person, and Egypt, by the way, ancient Egypt was among the best as far as the leading cultural centers in the whole world. How could they worship you know, a, a, a created thing, including this frog goddess? Well, how could you worship a car? Seriously, well, what's the idol in your life? Maybe God is going to smash her. Maybe he's already smashing those things. And you wonder, Lord, why are you allowing this to happen? Maybe because you were so worshiping that idol and not worshiping the Lord. But if it's a dream, if it's a goal, 
and ultimately you want to give God the glory for it, then even if he closes one door, he'll open a window. The key is who is getting the glory? Not to us, O oh Lord, not to us, but to thy name be the glory. One thing about what's happening in this text today, we see the punishment of Egypt for its sin of enslaving these people. For 400 years, they had been slaving people. Now, right now, America seems to be under God's judgment. We're reaping what we've sown. We've expelled God from the schools, and we've raised a few generations of barbarians. Many of them hate America. We see these statues being torn down and so forth. Uh, it started with the Confederate statues, but just the other day in Oregon, somebody took an American flag, set it on fire on the face of a George Washington statue, and then they brought that George Washington statue down. That's amazing. We're, we're, we're reaping what we've sown. We've killed 60 million unborn babies. We've supposedly redefined marriage, something only God can do in this society. And although we've made great strides in race relationships, much of that seems to be set back. Sometimes God judges nations. I think America is being judged right now. America was certainly being judged during the Civil War. Abraham Lincoln said in the second inaugural address, fondly do we hope, fervently do we pray, that this mighty scourge of war may speedily pass away, yet if God wills that it continues until all the wealth piled by the bondmen's 250 years of unrequited toil shall be sunk, and until every drop of blood drawn with the lash shall be paid by another drawn with the sword, as was said 3,000 years ago, so still it must be said, the judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. In many of our churches, there's so much talk about the love of God, which is absolutely fantastic. and We need to talk about the love of God. But you know what? You don't understand the love of God unless you understand the wrath of God. And there is a lot in the Bible about God's anger towards sin. God is angry with the wicked every day. J.I. Packer, in his fantastic book, Knowing God, he said this, the Bible could be called the book of God's wrath, for it is full of portrayals of divine retribution from the cursing and banishment of Adam and Eve in Genesis 3 to the overthrow of Babylon and the great assizes of Revelation 17 through 18 and chapter 20. Sometimes, though, we just, we, we try to just, you know, talk about the love of God, but we leave out the important point. I've mentioned this anecdote before. I want to mention it again, because I had the privilege to, to verify it with the author whom it was involved. You know the beautiful hymn, In Christ Alone. It's a modern classic, and it's, it's made the rounds. We, we've sung it many times in this church. Well, two, two men wrote it. And one of the verses says, And on that cross, as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied. Of course, those who believe in Jesus, because of what he did for us on the cross, the wrath of God is satisfied for us. That's why he said when he died, It is finished. It is finished paid in full. The debt is paid. For those who believe in him, the wrath of God no longer abides them. Those who don't believe in him, when they die, they will be cast from his presence forever and be punished for their own sins in justice. So, a liberal denomination within Presbyterianism said, oh, we like this hymn, In Christ Alone. So they contacted the, the writers. They said, we want to pay you, put your hymn in our wonderful hymnal. There's one little favor we want to ask of you, though. What's that? Well, you know that line where it says, and on the cross, as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied. Can you change it to, and on the cross, where Jesus died, the love of God was magnified. And the author said, no. And the denomination said, no. And I say, praise God. They stood, they stood firm, but too often, we have this uh, phenomenon of the evangelifish, fish, you know, where we just sort of give in and it's, it's always the love of God, but you never really understand the love of God unless you understand the wrath of God. And surely Egypt and Pharaoh were being punished 
for the 400 years of unrequited toil. Verse 9 and 10 say, Moses said to Pharaoh, be pleased to command me when I am to plead for you and for your servants and for your people that the frogs be cut off from you and your houses and be left only in the Nile. And he said, tomorrow. And Moses said, be it as you say, so that you may know that there is no one like the Lord our God. It was the Lord in judgment through his servants, Moses and Aaron, that brought all these frogs in when Pharaoh said, I can't take it anymore. I'll let your people go. Then Moses and Aaron said, okay, we're going to have those frogs leave so that you may know that there is no one like the Lord our God. Here is the overarching goal, the knowledge of God. And as we saw in that verse at the very beginning of the service in Jeremiah 31, God has a goal that the, his, the knowledge of the Lord will fill the whole earth, that everyone may know that he is the Lord and there is no other. Now, verses 11 through 14. The frogs shall go away from you and your houses and your servants and your people. They shall be left only in the Nile. So Moses and Aaron went from Pharaoh, and Moses cried to the Lord about the frogs as he agreed with Pharaoh, and the Lord did according to the word of Moses. The frogs died out in the houses, the courtyards, and the fields, and they gathered them together in heaps, and the land stank. We have five senses. I am of the persuasion that the strongest of the senses is the olfactory sense. Olfactory? Here, here's a mnemonic device. How do you remember the word olfactory? Well, what does it mean? It refers to our sense of smell. Well, an olfactory probably smells pretty bad. So anyway, olfactory. I, I work full-time as a TV producer. So all the things that I do, including you know the, having the privilege to preach here and serve here at the church, my full-time job is, is as a TV producer. I could show you video, not you, but I could show to the cameraman who was with me 25 years ago, 1995, I could show him a certain video. We shot this interview in Chicago, and I would say to him, do you remember anything about this interview? And he would say, yes. That man's breath was so bad, it just sort of filled the room. It was like, oh. I mean, it was, just, it was, it was amazing. I'll tell you what. If you were to talk to one of these Egyptians 25 years after this experience, those who survived, and you said, you remember those plagues? Other than the one where they lost a, a child in the plague, they would say, yeah, remember all those frogs? They stank so bad. The sense of sm smell is very powerful and hard to erase. Verse 15, but when Pharaoh saw that there was a respite, he hardened his heart and would not listen to them as the Lord had said. Then comes the next two plagues, both involving insects. And uh, I'm sure, like me, you hate insects. <laughs> and uh, oh, that Adam and Eve had not sinned and caused the plagues of the insects to come upon us. And in this plague, the first one comes the gnats. Verses 17, 18, 19. All the dust of the earth became gnats in all the land of Egypt. The magicians tried by their secret arts to produce gnats, but they could not. They could do some of these other things, including bringing frogs, but they couldn't create gnats uh, like this. And then the magician said to Pharaoh, this is the finger of God. But Pharaoh's heart was hardened, and he would not listen to them as the Lord had said. And if you indulge me, I'm going to read again from the D. James Kennedy Study Bible. The third plague saw lice all over the land. This word means lice or perhaps ticks or probably fleas. Now, one of the gods of the Egyptians was the god of earth, Seb, the earth god, and they worshiped the earth. We can picture those fleas hopping up all over the place. The Egyptians reverence for the ground, having it covered with trillions of fleas or lice would no doubt cool their amorous desire for that earth god, Seb. Verses 20. Through 24. Then the Lord said to Moses, Tell Pharaoh, if you will not let my people go, behold, I will send swarms of flies on you and your servants and your people and into your houses, and the houses of the Egyptians shall be filled with swarms of flies and also the ground on which they stand. But on that day I will set apart the land of Goshen, where my people dwell, so that no swarms of flies shall be there. 
that you may know that I am the Lord in the midst of the earth. Thus I will put a division between my people and your people. Tomorrow this sign shall happen, and the Lord did so. D. James Kennedy, the fourth plague involves the flies. The Hebrew word means swarms. Scholars say that probably they were not flies so much as they were beetles common to that era, area called the scarabaeus, from which we get the word scarab, which is a black beetle, a black dung beetle. And it is worshipped even to this very day in Egypt, I suppose, by some Egyptians. I'm sure that after they had a couple hundred thousand of those in every home in Egypt, they were not thrilled with the god of Scarabius. One of the names of the devil is Beelzebub. When that is translated, what does it mean? It means Lord of the Flies. There's just something almost demonic about swarms of flies. Uh, I remember a discussion sometimes somebody was having. It was actually in Norway, where my wife is from. And the question was, well, what's the most dangerous animal on Earth? And I don't know if you can call an insect an animal, but the answer, of course, is mosquitoes because of the diseases that they spread. I was reading a book just a couple weeks ago about the great hurricane in the Keys that devastated the, the Middle Keys in 1935 on Labor Day. And in the book, they were talking about what conditions were like in the Keys in general in those days before they had mosquito control. Listen to this description. Here was a man living in the Keys who was from Indiana. He said, about the middle of June, the mosquitoes were so bad that it was almost impossible to stay there. That is in the, the middle keys, like Isla Morada. You had to stay in the house or shack or tent or hut from the time it began to get dark until bright daylight. You just could not stay out there on those keys. Those tiny little pesky mosquitoes were, were making life so terrible. At that time, many people living there would keep their cabins dark at night so that they would not attract mosquitoes. Some nights, you could not go outside, he said, of the shacks without the mosquitoes swarming all over you. Wow, these tiny little insects can do great damage. I was reading about a tree in Colorado. It was 400 years old, and one day it finally crashed and fell to the earth. It had died, even though it was so majestic all those years. It had been struck by lightning 14 times. That didn't bring it down. It, uh, it had windstorms occur to it, lashed it, but that didn't bring it down. There was even an earthquake. That didn't bring it down. What did it were tiny little beetles boring under the bark. They chewed away its fibers until one day this gigantic tree came thundering down. And we see this, this plague that God brings on the Egyptians to punish them, including using these insects. And uh, I'll tell you, if I were Egyptian at the time, I'd be like, hey, how do, I get to, how do I get my ticket to the land of Goshen? I don't want to be here anymore, seriously. And uh, it's interesting how sometimes in God's providence, he allows God's people to go through the same penalties that people in the world go through. If a hurricane comes, it doesn't spare us necessarily because we're Christian. Uh, sometimes it does. You know, we, who knows the ways of providence? I like the way Jesus put it. In John chapter 11, he said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies. So sometimes we're spared these things, sometimes we're not. Bottom line is, God will bring judgment on the earth because of our sin. We saw Pastor Bean was talking last week about Revelation chapter 16 and some of the plagues described in Exodus will be repeated at the end of time when God is judging the whole world again because of sin. Two times in Exodus chapter 8 in our passage we see that God is doing all these things for one grand overarching purpose so that they may know I am the Lord. Who may know? Everybody. Egypt, Pharaoh, the Hebrews, us. These things happened 3,400 years ago. And we're still talking about them. Isn't that interesting? Begin with the end in mind. That's the old famous phrase from Stephen Covey in his book, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. And God said, 
to his servant Jeremiah, as we saw at the beginning of this whole service, that one day there will be this new covenant, and of course it is Jesus Christ who brings about this new covenant, and one of the key aspects of this new covenant is that the whole world may know about the Lord. Now, we know about the Old Testament, and of course the New Testament, because these ideas have spread all around the world because of Christianity, quite frankly. Well, Benjamin Disraeli, who was a Jewish man who believed in Jesus, and he was a great prime minister in Victorian England, so in the late 1800s, and he once said this about Jesus and the knowledge of the Jews. He said, the pupil of Moses may ask himself whether all the princes of the house of David have done so much for Jews as that prince who was crucified. Has, had it not been for Jesus, the Jews would have been comparatively unknown or known only as a high oriental caste which had lost its country. Has not he made their history the most famous history in the world? The wildest dreams of their rabbis have been far exceeded. Has not Jesus conquered Europe and changed his name to Christendom? All countries that refuse the cross wilt, and the time will come when the countless myriads of America and Australia will find music in the songs of Zion and solace in the parables of Galilee. Knowing God should be the focus of our lives. It is God's goal to know the Lord and to make him known, of course, through Jesus Christ our Lord. There was a, a little girl who was asked to recite the, the opening line of the 23rd Psalm. And she said, the Lord is my shepherd, and that's all I want. The Lord is my shepherd, and that's all I want. And that's beautiful, that's a beautiful point. Now this is Father's Day, and it's important to recognize there's a link that fathers have to how their children think about God. Think about it. When you, what you think about the Lord and your relationship with Jesus Christ is the single most important part of you, your life. And unfortunately, millions in our society today are suffering because of fatherlessness, absentee dads. Uh, in, in many inner city situations, as much as 75 to 80 percent of the children, the households are without the benefit of having a father there. In some cases, uh, courts order the father out of the home. It's really bad. But Hollywood and the culture shapers in our country, uh, they've basically, in some ways, they've made fathers ridiculous figures. You remember back in the 50s, there were, and even the 60s, you had Father Knows Best. You wouldn't have a show like that today. Father Knows Best? No, 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 the kids know best. Uh, leave it to Beaver with a positive uh, aspect, positive, respectable father figures. But then we devolved in the 70s to Archie Bunker, and here's the, you know, the, he's prejudiced, and he's certainly the father figure, no question about it, but he's, he's benighted. He's not somebody that you would want to emulate. And then you devolve to Homer Simpson. And he may be lovable, but he's certainly buffoonish, and he's certainly not a role model. And there's a book called Hearts of the Fathers. Charles Chris Myers said that many children today in America lack the God-ordered earthly anchor for soul security. In other words, because dad is not in the home, they lack that security. He, he went on to say, it is well known but seldom discussed whether in the church house or the White House that fatherlessness lies at the root of nearly all of the most glaring problems that plague our modern, now post-Christian life. For example, take the issue of poverty. He says, children living in female-headed households have a poverty rate of 48%, more than four times the rate for children living in homes with their fathers and mothers. He also points out fathers are so important in the Bible, beginning with God the Father, that the words father, fathers, and forefathers appear 1,573 times in the Bible. That's amazing. Obviously, children in fatherless homes can survive and even thrive despite that handicap, but what a better thing it is to follow God's design for the family. 
So I thank God for all you fathers out there doing the best you could, and just being there makes a huge difference. Somebody once said, how do you spell, I think it was James Thompson, how do you spell love when it comes to a father-son, father-daughter relationship? Time, T-I-M-E, that's how you spell love. There's also a link between fatherlessness and unbelief. About 20 years ago, when he was a professor at New York University, Dr. Paul Vitz wrote a book called The Faith of the Fatherless, and he basically traced how virtually all the famous atheists and skeptics in, in times like Voltaire, Bertrand Russell, H.G. Wells, Nietzsche, the one who said God is dead, Jean-Paul Sartre, Thomas Hobbes, and Sigmund Freud, among others, they all had absentee father figures or an absentee dad, period. They did not have the, the benefit of fathers. But he also said on the other side, if you have strong families, strong fathers, then you have the, the greater tendency to believe. He said, I would say the biggest problem in the country is the breakdown of the family, and the biggest problem in the breakdown of the family is the absence of the father. Our answer is to recover the faith, particularly for men, and we'll recover fatherhood. And if we recover fatherhood, we'll recover the family. And if we recover the family, we'll recover our society. If you're a father, and you stay with your children, and you love your wife, you are a real hero, whether people recognize it or not. Keep it up, because our nation is counting on you. On this Father's Day, I hope we can all draw closer to our Heavenly Father, make sure we worship Him and Him alone through the power of the Holy Spirit in the name of Jesus Christ and not some other lesser God, some sort of idol that is set up for destruction. And I hope we can all have the same sentiment as that little girl. The Lord is my shepherd, and that's all I want. May we pray. Heavenly Father, give us greater love for you. Thank you for Jesus Christ, who's made it all possible. Jesus, the very thought of you, with sweetness fills my breast, but even more thy face to see, and in thy presence rest. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. And please rise as we sing our final hymn, Jesus, the very thought of thee, number 89. Jesus was there. Loved ones know 
Jesus, our only joy be Thou, as Thou our prize wilt be. Jesus, be Thou our glory now, and through eternity. Receive now the benediction, and then Justin has a few final remarks. Put out your hands there, please. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Thank you all for being with us this morning. We just want to continue to dismiss in an orderly fashion. Uh, it's been working very well this way, so thank you for your patience. And again, happy Father's Day, and great to see all of you with us this morning, and great to see you this morning. So to begin, please, all those in the balcony, uh, you are dismissed. I would ask that as best you can, we'll see you next week. Good to have you with us. I'd ask that you would uh, d dismiss yourselves, go down the stairway, and then...